Uh, but this morning, I want to talk to you about this idea of growing on purpose. And uh, we often fail to consider the gradual cumulative effect of sin in our lives. So in St. Louis, in 1984, an unemployed cleaning woman noticed a few bees buzzing around the attic of her home. And over the summer, uh, since there was only a few bees, she made no effect and no way to try to deal with them. And over the course of the summer, these bees continued to fly in and out of her attic vent while the woman remained completely unconcerned and unaware of the growing city of bees. The whole attic became a hive, and the ceiling of the second floor bedroom finally caved in under the weight of hundreds of pounds of honey and thousands and thousands of angry bees. Now, while this woman escaped serious injury, she was unable to repair the damage that had had accumulated accumulated, wow, with her neglect. How many of you, there are two types of people in this room this morning. There are those who will drive their vehicle to the very, very bottom of E. You will go to the lowest possible point and then say to yourself, I still got time. How many is that? That's you. That's you. Now there's the opposite that as soon as it goes past three quarters of a tank, you are gone back to the gas station to make sure that you won't run out of gas. How many of that? Okay. Now, I find, now this isn't always true, but I do find in marriages there are people that are on opposite scales. I am the, if it's past half, I'm starting to think about getting gas. My wife She's the dare, she's, she's the, the risk taker. She's the one that when I get into her vehicle and it's below E and the lights flashing and there's radar and sirens going off and there's somebody that pops out of the back seat and says, you should get some gas. Where did you come from? And, and she'll say to me still, oh, we're good. We still, like we have to go 50 kilometers. Oh no, we're good. We're good. We're good. I don't trust her vehicle on E. I, I, it doesn't make any sense to me, and so I'm always, and then, you know, she's also the type of person, and I, I, she's right over there, and so I'm going to pick on her a little bit this morning, but she's also the type of person that when all those lights come flashing in on the car, you know, the, uh, uh, the warning lights of certain things, there'll be three or four. Her, her dashboard is lit up like a Christmas tree, and I'll get in there, and I'll say, uh, honey, how long have these lights been on? Goes, I don't know, a couple weeks. What? You're killing me. You're killing me. And honestly, I think sometimes the Christian life is like that. That if we don't get proactive about our faith, if we don't get proactive about our relationship with God, like the lady with the bees, like the cars getting on E, we, we realize that sometimes it's a little too late. And we wonder how we got to where we're at. We wonder how we're dead on the side of the road and go, oh, if I had just got gas. The lady who's dealing with the bees and the honey and the floor coming through, if she had just said, oh, if I had just got some raid and killed those bees earlier, I probably would have a house still. And so this morning I want to give you four areas about this idea of growing on purpose. Okay, not unintentional growth, not things that happen by happenstance, not things where you accidentally walk into a moment with God and it blows your mind and you're like, wow, I didn't expect that to happen. We're talking about intentional growth, things that we need to do to grow on purpose. And so if you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to be turning to Mark chapter 9. And I don't have PowerPoint. Listen, I, I'm not that old, but I'm old enough to know that, like, I don't need to entertain you with cool graphics behind me, okay? So you're going to look at the Carpenter's Church logo for the next two hours, and it'll be great, and uh, we're providing lunch for you guys today. Surprise, Pastor Jason. And, um, and so you have this story in Mark chapter 9. It's the story of Jesus going up onto a mountain with his boys, his three tight guys, 
and he has this transfiguration. He has this moment where he literally transforms in front of these three guys. And, um, and, and so Peter, James, and John are with Jesus, and he has this transformation, and they're on this spiritual high to a point where they say, we should stay here. We should put up some tents, and let's just hang out. And Jesus is like, no, you're missing it. We need to, we need to go. And, and, and they have the, this kind of discussion. And on the midst of coming down from the mountain, they walk into what I can only describe as real life. They walk into the disciples having an argument, the Bible says, with, with scribes and other people, and, and, and they're dealing with real life. How many of you, just as a side note, have had an amazing experience with God in your life and then the very next moment walk into what is real life, right? God, I love you, I love you, I love you so much. And then you have your five-year-old walk into the room. Yeah, blah, right? We all love our kids as far as we can throw them sometimes, right? We just love our kids. They're so great. Until they wake you up at 3 o'clock in the morning wanting more milk. And then reality hits. Or you have a great Sunday, and then you go to work on Monday, and your boss is a jerk. And you're like, I love you so much, because Jesus tells me to, or else I'd kill you. We have these high moments, these mountaintop experiences, and then we hit real life. And so the first thing I want to talk about this morning is that we grow through our mountaintop experiences. When you're on a high with Jesus, when you have an encounter with God, you know, we often hear that, oh, we, we grow, some of our deepest growth happens in the valleys of life. And that's very true. But we also grow on the mountaintops of life. When things are exciting, because God shows us things and reveals things to our lives, and there are so many things that are exciting. But the point is that we can't stay on the mountaintop. You can't always be on a spiritual high. We all love the mountaintops, and they're joyful and victorious times. But these are places that we want to be spiritually, but our faith is a journey. It's not a stopping place. The mountaintop is not a stopping place. And see, the point is that what we, t what we learn on the mountaintops, we need to take with us into the valley. See, what you get from God up high, you need to bring with you when you're low. Listen, I heard somebody say one time that what God shows to you in the light doesn't disappear in the darkness, right? So what you see, what you're promised on a high doesn't mean that it goes away when things get bad. Because I don't know about you, but my life is not always high. There, there are times where my life kind of sucks. There are times when, when I wonder if God even cares about me. There are times with wh whether I wonder if God even listens and hears my prayer. And then I read the book, uh, uh, the Bible, and I, I see that there are other people in the book of Psalms and the book of Proverbs who feel the same way that I do. I'm so, I'm so close to God, and in other moments, I'm so far from God. So we must take what we learn on the mountaintop into the valley. A true God experience will change us. And if we've had a mountaintop experience with God, then we should be closer to God than we were ever before. We must take what we've learned on the mountaintop into the valley below to help carry us through until the next mountaintop. And so these guys, they come down from the mountain. They've had this mountaintop experience. And then they walk into, as we see in verse 14... They come down, and it says, And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw them, were greatly amazed and ran up to him, Jesus, and greeted him. And he asked them, Why are you guys arguing? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able to. And he answered them, O faithful, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? And he says, bring him to me. The second thing we notice about in this chapter is that we grow through conflict. We grow when people challenge us. When someone questions what we believe and why we believe it, we dig into the Bible and we study it and we, and, and, and we get back to what we believe. And in that process, we grow and we learn. Um, 
on Thursday, I had the opportunity to go to uh, Saskatoon Christian School. And uh, I got the real easy topic of uh, preaching to grade fives to grade eight, the easy topic of the end times. <laughs> Try explaining the end times to grade fives to grade eights. I was like, oh man, and, and then do it in 25 minutes. So I was like, uh, Jesus is coming back, uh, be ready. I, I don't know what to tell you. I, and so we go back to the classroom, and I expected to be there five minutes, okay? So um, I was there from 1.15, I spoke at 1.30, was done at 2 o'clock. I expected to be back at the church by 2.30. We had these question and answer periods, and I'm, uh, and maybe, look, I've been dealing with junior highs and senior highs, like, for 15 years, okay? That, I, I've been a youth pastor for that long. And I've seen over the years some brilliant grade eights, but I've also seen... Anyways, and so I expected not to be blown away, let's be honest. And I was sitting there, and I'm like, okay, let's open it up. And for the first three or four questions, I got exactly what I expected, right? Do, do our angels, do they get married? Um, uh, am I going to be married when I get to heaven? And I, you know, I'd say to the kid, no, not you, but maybe someone else might. I don't know. And... We got, and then we actually got to this weird moment where kids were asking some ridiculously crazy questions. I had one girl ask me, what if Satan goes to God and asks God for forgiveness? Would God let Satan back into heaven? And if he did... Does that mean that all the end time prophecies and the book of Revelation and all these, does that mean they're all false and not accurate? And I was like, <laughs> I was like, are you sure you're in grade eight? <laughs> I, I know adults that don't think that deep. And it started to make me wonder about how well do I know the Bible? There was an internal conflict in me that said, I don't fully know some of the answers. So I gave her an opinion, but I also gave her what I understood to be the context of, of uh, God's character and so on and so forth. I'm not going to tell you what I said, because I don't want to be wrong. <laughs> but in this conflict in me, I had to go back to the Bible and take a look. My question to you this morning is, have you ever talked to somebody enough to actually have your faith challenged? Where are you in your walk with the Lord where people are talking to you about your faith and you're not quite sure that you have the answer and so you need to go back and take a look? See, we are growing on purpose when we are in the lives of people muddying around and people are asking us questions that we don't know maybe the answer to. And so we have to go back to the source. We have to go back to Jesus. We have to go back to the Bible. And see, in verse 18, we see that these guys, uh, the Bible says that the, the, the man asked the disciples to heal his son. And the Bible says that they didn't. They couldn't. And see, when we try to do spiritual things on our own power, we fail. And we learn that spiritual things can only be accomplished by God's power. So sometimes we try to do stuff on our own, and it's in that failure we realize, why did I even try? And I don't know about you, but there's so many times where I've become quite good at what I do. I've been quite good at being a pastor. I'm quite good at dealing with teenagers. I'm quite good at taking missions trips and all these things that we do on a regular basis. And maybe that's my life, but in maybe your life, you do something habitually, and, and you can do it on your own without God. And then we try to, like, do spiritual things. We, we try to pray for somebody. We try to pray for ourselves or, or whatever. And, and we realize that the whole time, we really haven't been spiritual. We really haven't been doing the things that we should to grow in God. And then we lay hands on somebody and wonder why they don't get healed. 
And I do wonder in this passage if the disciples were like that, where they were kind of on a low. They were kind of in this moment of their life where they weren't growing on purpose. And then they go to try to do something spiritually and fail. And God's like, yeah, but you were trying to do it in your own power. The other thing we see in this is that, you know, this, this young lad, he, he, he starts freaking out when Jesus, when, when, when the dad brings this boy to Jesus, the, the boy starts freaking out and convulsing. And I personally think that anytime we get close to Jesus, the devil's going to throw a fit. The devil wants to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to keep you separated from God, and he will do everything that he possibly can to keep you away from God. And I think one of the things that he does in this generation of people to keep you away from God is provide you with unendless entertainment, unendless distractions, unendless notifications, uh, doesn't have to be a cell phone, but there's so many great TV shows and there's so many great internet things and all. The, and we, the, the one thing that the devil can do to keep us distracted and keep us away from God is keep us busy doing everything else but. And that's why we need to become intentional in our growth. Because if we're not intentional, we can be easily lulled into distraction. And so anytime we get close to Jesus, the devil wants to th- throw a fit. The last thing the devil wants is for us to get close to God. I just, I think it's funny that that the dad asked for the disciples' help, and they couldn't do it. And while Jesus was on the mountain, the disciples down among the people were his representatives. People today are bringing their friends who need God to church because the church should be the Christ's representatives here on earth. But the church today experiences the same problems that the disciples did on that day. It's unable to help some of those in desperate need. These people who are in such need need only to be brought to church that they need to be brought to Jesus. Listen, I see so many times in years where people will bring people to church and think that the programs are going to fix them. They think that that a good worship set is going to fix them. That, that think that a good youth ministry with lots of stuff to offer is going to fix them. And in reality, they need to be brought to Jesus. And sometimes we think if we just bring them, we're done. I brought them to church. And they're watching our lives. They're watching how we live. They're watching what we say. Listen, I can tell you in all the years, I bet you I can count three students who remember my sermons. But what they do remember is how I live when I was there for them in the hard time, when I was taking the time to grow with them on purpose, when I was taking the time to show them Jesus on purpose by being there when it mattered, by giving an encouraging word when it mattered. The church must be focused on pointing people to Jesus. And Jesus should be the main focus of every ministry in our churches. And Jesus should be your main focus in your life because people will see Jesus through you. Are you growing on purpose? Another thing that happens when we grow is we grow at the end of our rope. How many people have been there before? You have just been at the end of your rope. You have done. You, you, you know, maybe you're that person who tangibly screams, Ah! I'm done! Right? You punch the wall, you, you freak out. You know, you know, I know you've been there because some of you are smiling, but you're not like, I don't want to admit that, right? You've just had enough. I know that I've had times. Like, listen, I remember my little sister, when uh, she was in Bible college, my little sister, Rachel, would be in her room and she'd be yelling, yelling. And I would go up to the door and I'm like, who is she yelling at in there? And I'd peek in and open the door and she'd be yelling yelling at God and like ah! I'm like what she's crazy mommy and daddy you should do something about her maybe get rid of her she's nuts but she would be at the end of her rope when it came to something and yet I've found in my life that in the end, when I get to the end of the rope when I get to the end of what I think I can bear it's like when God just kind of comes in and says you know we do this with our kids right when they're, t- they're tantruming are you done? 
Oh, you're not done. Okay, I'll wait. You done now? All right. Ugh. What I was going to say, and I feel like God does that with us sometimes, right? We freak out, and then God's like, yeah, are you done? Okay, what I was going to say was, I got you. Be still and know that I'm God. You may not see the answer yet, but it's coming. You know, uh, my mom used to say, it wouldn't be a step of faith if you knew the outcome. Sometimes having a little faith, you just got to wait to see. You don't know the outcome, but you got to trust in God. And you can get to the end of your rope, and you're like, okay, God, I got nothing left. And God's like, finally, you're going to let me actually take control. And so this man brings his son. He goes, I got nothing left. I've gone to even your disciples. I got nothing left. And Jesus says, I got you. I got you. I got you. And he says, all things are possible for those who believe. And he heals the son. Sometimes we, we grow at the very end of our rope. The final thing this morning is this, that we grow through confession. See, the boy's father had some faith, but he realized that he didn't have enough faith. He needed help with the part of him that was discouraged, disappointed, and disillusioned. God always knows where we are by confession, and we acknowledge that we need God's help. This, this man goes to God and says, I, I, I can't do anything else. I don't have enough faith. I don't have enough faith. Can you... Can you help me with my faith? And God says, yes, I can. And by the way, I'll heal your boy. See, we need to confess that we can't do it. We need to confess that we're not greater than God. And what ends up happening is if we are not growing intentionally, bees start coming into our hives, into our houses. Bees start coming into our attics. We start to get further away from God when we're not confessing to our sin. We're not confessing the things that we need God for. Bees start coming in. And then you always wonder, maybe I'm the only one, but you always wonder, how did I get here? You look back and go, how did I get here? How did my life get to this point? How did my walk with God get to this point? And I sometimes think God says, because you let the bees come in and you didn't deal with them. You let the sin creep in and you didn't confess it. You let the pride come in. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm as proud as anybody. I have to beat that out of myself daily. Honestly, sometimes I walk around saying I'm the most humblest person I know. It's not good. And I have to have confession. And see, when we pray, when we ask for, for, for confession, prayer leads us to God. Because we're praying. Prayer moves God. An act of prayer life gets us up. It gets us in the right spiritual condition to fight off the attacks of the devil. Helps us to prepare ourselves for our daily daily life. And too often I see that people are not reading their word. Too often I see that people are not praying. The only prayer they say is, dear God, bless this food to our bodies. And they spend no time in prayer. They're not growing in their prayer life. They're not growing in their confessions life. They're not growing in their Bible reading. And the only time they crack their Bible or their Bible app is when they come to church on Sunday. They're not growing intentionally. The story of Bob Beale, and he started chatting with a man who trains animals for Hollywood movies. He's the uh, owner and operator of an, the Arizona Circus. He says, How is it that you can stake down a, te a 10 ton elephant with the same size stake that you use for the l little elephants? And he asked, pointing to a baby elephant who weighed 300 pounds. It's easy, the trainer said. 
When they are babies, we stake them down. And they try to tug away and stake uh, from the stake maybe 10,000 times before they realize they can't possibly get away. And at that point, their elephant memory takes over and they remember for the rest of their lives that they can't get away from the stake. Humans are sometimes like elephants. I'm built like an elephant, just saying. Um, when we are teenagers, some unthinking, insensitive, unwise person says, oh, they're not very good at planning, or she's not a good leader, or, or their team will never make it, and zap, we drive a mental stake into our minds. And often we become mature adults, and we still are held back by some inaccurate one-sentence one stake that puts in our minds that when we were young. Today, you're an adult capable of much more than you realize. You are far more capable than you, you were 12 months ago, and you're going to be far more capable than you are in a year. But yet, for some people, sin has placed a stake in their spiritual life. They have tried and tried on their own to remove it to no avail. Now they believe that they're attached to this sin forever. I can't grow because you don't know what I'm going through. I've been dealing with this thing for so long. I've tried to grow on purpose, but you don't understand my situation. You don't understand my circumstance. And now they believe they're attached to this sin forever with no hope of release. Guys, I'm here to tell you today that God wants to take that stake of sin away and free you up. And to do that, we need to grow we need to grow on purpose. We can't, we can't let our sin hold us back. We can't let the life of, of, of a cell phone or internet or, or things of the devil to, to distract us keep us held back. This is a fight that we're in. We are in a battle, and we need to be intentional about our lives. I know that if I'm not reading my Bible, I know that if I'm not praying, I know that if I'm not going to church, if I'm not surrounding myself with people, if I'm not growing through my little interactions with a grade 8 girl who is challenging me beyond my faith can handle at the moment, if I can't get to the end of my rope when I just can't figure it out on my own, and I can't do that, and I don't go to God, if we don't go to God, we have nothing. We will continue to be staked down. And I just see it so often that people are staked down. And you say, are you reading your Bible? No. Are you praying? No. When's the last time you had a mountain high experience with God? I can't remember. Are you being fruitful in your life? Not really. Do you love Jesus? Well, yeah, I go to church. And we miss it. And we miss it. God wants to take the stake out. He wants to free you up. He wants to free you up to be the best that you can be for him. And in your life. Let's pray. Lord, I pray this morning. God, for those at Carpenters and those at Elam and those all across the city, God, who have been just living the average, normal, mundane faith. Lord, I pray this morning for faith to rise up in men and women here today. I pray for people to have mountaintop experiences. I pray for people to end up in conflict, God, so that their faith can be challenged and that their faith can grow. Lord, I pray for people who have always said, you know, I want to read my Bible and I want to pray, but they keep putting it off and they keep putting it off and they keep putting it off and the bees start to accumulate in the attic. Lord, I pray that we be men and women of your word that we're men and women of prayer, that we're men and women who confess that we can't do it without you, God. I pray for the stake in our life, the thing that holds us back, the thing that we think we can't get rid of. I pray, God, that we give it to you this morning. And Lord, I pray that even today as we walk out of this building, that we walk out of this place, that those stakes are removed and there's such a sense of your presence in our life. There's a sense that, God, there's hope for tomorrow. There's joy. There's a peace. God, that, that, that there's a new day coming. And, Lord, that we can give it all to you and know that it was not by us, not by our power, but by your spirit. 
I thank you for this church. I pray for Pastor John as he's away right now. I pray for Jason and, and Garrett and, and everybody that's involved here. I pray that you bless them. I pray that you bless this church. God, the, the work that they're doing is so amazing. And Lord, I pray for, for a new day for Carpenters and this family in your precious name.